I want to invite any of the family of Jacob that would like to kind of stand in support of what he's doing, come maybe right up here into this area or anyone else that's close to the family that would like to just show their support by being right up here with him. Well, Jacob, you may not understand this, but this is my favorite part. Some people think preaching is maybe the favorite part of a pastor, but the preaching is only for a greater purpose, and that's this, helping people to make decisions for Jesus. And I am so grateful that the Holy Spirit has worked in your life, that you are listening to that most important voice in your life, and that is the voice of God how he speaks to us from the people around us and he speaks to us from the Bible. I'm so grateful you filled out that card some time ago to give your heart to the Lord and to be baptized. And I know that as you've studied over the last several weeks, you've learned some things, but it has made that commitment even more special now that you know exactly what you're doing and why you're doing it. And so, Jacob, I just want you to know that the decision you make today that if you remain faithful to the vows that you have made and taken, that you will never know what it's like to be alone, that God will always be a part of your life, that you will always have someone that will help you to make the right decisions in life. And that is something to be truly treasured. So Jacob, because you've accepted Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior of your life, because you've accepted his death on Calvary as a gift, that God has given to you that you might have eternal life. It's my privilege as a minister of the gospel to baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit for the remission of all of your sins and now for a brand new life in Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we do that again? That was kind of practice. That was kind of practice. Take a, take a deep breath. Are you okay? All right. So I'm going to just help you out just a little bit. Let's try it one more time. I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Awesome. I want you to know that Jacob has been a little bit afraid of water, and this was a big thing for him. And so we want you to know how proud we are of you. God bless you. I want to have a a prayer before we transition into the next. Young people, I hope, as you've watched Jacob make this decision, and I should say some of you older ones out there, if the Holy Spirit is saying to you, you need to make that decision as well, I hope you'll respond to that. We look forward to the day that you'll be baptized. So let me pray. Father in heaven, we pray a special blessing upon Jacob as he's made this decision, as he's entered this water. And Lord, I know that uh, he has done that because he wants to surrender his life completely to you. Thank you for his decision today. And Father, I pray that you would reveal in our own hearts any decisions that we need to make. And if there is even one out there that you are leading, to be baptized, I pray before they leave today, they will say something to someone. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Any of you children who would like to go to Children's Church Kingdom Kids is starting at this point. It's also that time in our service where we come to God in prayer. And today, as our worship team leads us in song, if you would like to come to the altar and have that special time with the Lord, you may do so at this time remembering that we come close with our Savior in prayer.
27, it says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. I invite you now, if you are able, to please kneel as we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as you say in that verse, we need to come before you and ask and seek you. So today, we, on your Sabbath day, we, we come before you to ask you to come and dwell among us, Lord, to be amongst our church family, live in our hearts, and just be, a, be here with us today. Today we want to be inspired by Pastor Bill's um, sermon. We want to um, hear your message through him, Lord. So please anoint his lips, anoint our minds, and help us to not only hear what you speak through him, but to apply it to our lives and to grow closer to you because of it. Um, in, our, in our church family and individually, we have, we have many major decisions to make and things that are weighing upon our hearts, Lord. So please, we, we come to you seeking your guidance. Um, we want to be led by you. We want to know your, your will in our lives. So please lead us and guide us and show us your plan for all that we, we have on, on our hearts and on our minds. Um, in our church family, there are many people that are, are burdened and that are hurting. Um, specifically today, we want to lift up to you Leroy Neal. Lord, as he's recovering, please just be with that, his family, be with him in a special way as he um, goes through this hard and trying time. Just bless him. Today we're also very um, excited and, and, and happy for Jacob's decision, Lord. Please be with his family, be with him in a special way as he um, starts a new life with you. Um, and now as lots of us have a silent request, I ask that you please hear those now as we take a moment to lift those up to you. I thank you, Lord, for hearing and answering our prayers in, in your way and in your time. And I ask that you continue to bless us today as we go about the rest of our Sabbath day. In your, your name I pray. Amen. church and happy sabbath uh, today's offering is going towards the local church budget in matthew 6 8 jesus says do not be like them for your father knows what you need before you ask him who is them jesus is referring to hypocrites while some sarcastically state that the church is full of hypocrites each church has members who faithfully participate in the various ministries and support the church with their time, talents, tithes, and offerings. Just as Jesus says in Matthew that God knows what we need before we ask, faithful members often know what the needs of the church are because they are involved in the life of the church. Thank you for being a faithful supporter. Uh, today's offerings for the local church budget. The church budget supports the ministries of the church that provides the funds needed for the church building. And we are privileged to return our tithe and local church budget offering. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you for entrusting us with the spiritual truth and with material wealth as a sign of our love and our trust in you and in your promise. We return to you a portion of what is rightfully yours. Just as Jesus used the two fish and five loaves of bread that one boy offered to feed 5,000, we ask that you use what we offer to spiritually feed our local mission field and the worldwide mission field of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Day by day, and with each passing moment, strength I find to meet my trials here, trusting in my Father's 
Jesus wise bestowment. I've no cause for worry or for fear. He whose heart is kind beyond all measure gives unto each day what he deems best. Lovingly it's part of pain and pleasure, mingling toil with peace and rest. Every day the Lord himself is near me, special blessing for each child. All my cares he fain would bear and cheer me. He whose name is Counselor and Power, the protection of his child and treasure. Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1. Do you believe God has something that he wants to share with you from his word this morning? Do you believe that? I hope you do. What you look for, you usually find. What you try to hear... What you try to listen to, I guess, is what you hear. And I believe if there's ever a message for the people of God, it is in this story that we're going to look at this morning. So let's pray. We're entitled the message, When God Speaks. Father in heaven, thank you for the privilege of coming here to this place, to this moment. We have gathered, we have set the table. It has been good to be here this morning. And now, Lord, we need a word from you. Lord, we want to hear your voice. We want to hear you speak. Because we know that whatever you have to say to us is really the most important thing we could listen to. So help us to shut away all the noise and the voices that might be in our head this morning and just focus on listening to your voice. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
the children of Israel had spent basically their whole lives, at least this generation, their whole life wandering around in the wilderness. There probably weren't a whole lot of sights to see there in the desert. This rock, this, that, journeying, always on the move, but never seeming to get anywhere. You ever had a life that way, a season of your life where you seem busy and you seem like you're always doing something but you're never really seeing anything accomplished? That's kind of the way it was for this generation, for the children of Israel. They had, they had uh, as children, their parents had refused to be obedient and to go forward in faith. And so God was willing to turn them around and to wait for an obedient, a faithful generation. And now these were those that would go. It must have been discouraging to constantly remind yourself that you are the people of God, that God has made incredibly precious promises, and yet to be so close and yet so far. The wilderness experience wasn't, at their furthest point, they were not that far from the promised land, but yet they were. They were far, far away. And so, really, they, they must have been at one of their lowest points after 30 or so years, 38 years of wandering in the wilderness. And then, a terrible blow. Moses dies. Wow. You know, someone has said you don't really appreciate people until they're gone. And that's probably the way it was for the children of Israel. Boy, they had a love-hate relationship with Moses. When things were going well, well, they loved Moses, and they thought Moses was just great. But when things were not going well, it seemed like they believed Moses was part of the problem instead of the solution. But now they had reached a point where their leader had died, the one to, to whom they looked to represent God to them, the one that God would speak with and share his will. I don't know if they could have gotten any lower. Moses is the one that delivered them from bondage. Moses is the one that worked the miracles. Moses is the one who spoke from God to them. Now he was dead and gone. They had come so close and now their leader was gone. What would they do? At this lowest point in their life, what would happen? You know, it's been said that only 10% of life happens to us. The other 90% is how you relate to life. You, you, you realize that, right? That very little you have control of. You can control a few things, but most of the time you just have to live life as it comes. And how you choose to do that will determine the kind of life that you live. In fact, I want to share with you some of the observations that I have learned about why it seems that the children of, uh, of Israel, why God's people were stuck. And so this is a little mini-sermon inside a sermon, and it's simply this. Three mistakes that lead to getting stuck. Here's number one. They idolize the past. Did you notice that as you were reading through this past few weeks? That any time difficulty came, the children of Israel idolized the past. And everything I can read, their past wasn't that great. I mean, it was hard bondage. It was slaves that they were over there in Egypt. They cried out. They cried out to God that he would deliver them. And yet, as soon as they were gone, it seemed like they couldn't wait to get back. Oh, that we were back in Egypt. Oh, that we could eat of the flesh pots. Oh, that we could have... You know, it just... They idolized the past. How quickly they forgot how difficult their past was. And friends, that's one of the difficulties that you and I will face when we idolize the past. It inhibits us and it prevents us from moving forward. In fact, I believe that the best days of God's people are ahead. As long as you got breath... It's much better ahead of you than behind you, and even if you're getting older, that's still true. They idolize the past. They begin to romanticize the things that had happened to them in their past. And friends, for the people of God, that is a danger. Ask Lot's wife. She learned firsthand. Friends, we're in danger of doing the same thing. The future is in front of us. And it's hard to race towards the future when you keep looking in the past. You and I need to set our eyes on the future and forget about the past. Here's number two. They compromise the present. 
The children of Israel compromised the present, and by doing so, they became stuck. And what I mean by compromising the present is simply this. They compromised it by disobedience. Chapter after chapter after chapter that we've read throughout the books of Leviticus and Deuteronomy, and now we're going to find in in Numbers and, and now in Joshua, is simply this, that if you will be obedient, I will bless you more than you can even handle. I mean, I don't know how many of you feel like that's your kind of life right now, that the blessings of God are so great you can't handle anymore, that they're just spilling out of you. But that's what God said. But he also said that if you won't be obedient, I cannot bless you the way I want. And through their willful, consistent disobedience, they compromised the present. Look at Deuteronomy. Go back to Deuteronomy 31, right there at the end of it. Deuteronomy 31, verse 27. While Moses is yet alive, these are kind of his parting words to the children of Israel, he even predicted this very thing would happen. In Deuteronomy 31, verse 27, he says, For I know your rebellion and your stiff neck. If today, while I yet alive with you, you have been rebellious against the Lord, then how much more after my death? Moses called it the way it was. He said you are compromising the very things that God wants to give you through your disobedience. And so it causes us to get stuck. It's true today. Disobedience leads to stagnation. It leads to paralysis. It closes the hand of God that wants blessings to flow toward us. When we disobey God, we invite circumstances that are a lot less than what he desires. And here's number three. They discounted the future. And oh, people of God, if we've ever been in danger of something, it's this one. God had a future for them. God had a great future. God had a land flowing with milk and honey. God had all the blessings that he had promised to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and he continued. He couldn't wait for them to experience the future. But friends, because the wilderness is all that they ever knew, somehow they lost sight of their future And they were literally willing to dwell in the desert forever. It's all they had known, and so they became accustomed. In fact, some of the children of Israel said, we'll camp right here. This is good enough, rather than crossing over. Friends, if we're not careful, we begin to think that this earth is all that we have coming. And God says it's not. The best part of being about a Christian is not what we're going to get in this earth. It's what we're going to get when we cross over the Jordan. We have a heaven to win. And I, and I never understood why people want to discount that. Why they want to trade it away. Why do you want to settle for less than what God has for you? And that's what we see happening to the children of Israel. They had become content. They had begun to settle. Now there may be some people that are in the business of settling, but the people of God should never settle for less than what God says he wants to give to you. And yet we're so guilty of that. Are we in danger of staying on the wrong side of the river? Friends, you and I were made to be promised land dwellers. You were made for the promised land. You were not made for the desert. Have you figured that out? The desert will kill you. And it's slowly doing that. But God has created you to be a promised man promised land dweller. All right, well, let's look. But things are about to change for the people of God. In fact, they're about to change dramatically. Look at Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1, right at the beginning. Chapter 1, verse 1. After the death of Moses, and I like this almost parenthetical thought, the servant of God. I don't know what you want on your tombstone or your epitaph or what it is that you want people to remember you, but that's a, pretty good, that's a pretty good line right there. The servant of the Lord. It came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, 
saying, Moses, my servant is dead. Now therefore arise and go over this Jordan, you and all this people to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. I love this. This the, as Joshua chapter 1, verse 1 starts out, it's got to be the lowest point in the history of the children of Israel. I mean, they don't know what's going to happen. Their leader has died, and there is really no way for them to know what's going to happen. And it's at that lowest point that verse 1 rings out that now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, God spake. What did God do? God speaks. Friends, I want you to know, at the lowest point of your life, God speaks. He speaks into those times when we are frustrated. He speaks into those times when we are hurting and we are filled with dread and we are filled with uncertainty. God speaks. I love that phrase. The worst thing that ever happened to Israel, and then God spoke. God spoke. The pivotal point in the history of the people of God is when God speaks. Can you say amen? When God speaks, things change. When God speaks, things happen. You know what? When God speaks, when the word of the Lord gets to the people, it prepares them to possess the promises of God. And that's exactly what is going to happen through the experience of God speaking to Joshua and to the children of Israel. Four things I want to share with you very quickly that we should observe here. Three, Four things that will happen when God speaks. Here's number one. When God speaks, leadership emerged. In other words, when God speaks, leaders emerge. Moses was handpicked by God and he served his time and he served faithfully until the end he had his hiccups but friends he was faithful to the end and when his time was done God raises up another leader in fact he raised him up even before this point because we see Joshua in times past how God is preparing him how he is assisting Moses how he is observing how he is learning by example and the time came when God speaks And now it's Joshua's time. Joshua is in the background. Joshua is kind of behind the scenes. He's not ready to lead until God speaks. That's the way it is. That's how God works. It's a consistent pattern in Scripture. When God speaks, leaders emerge. When God spoke to Saul... It was the greatest change the Christian church would ever experience. Saul became Paul, and the Christian church went into hyperdrive. I mean, that guy went about planting churches, preaching the gospel. When God spoke, Jeremiah, one of the greatest prophets, emerged. When God spoke, John the Baptist, that forerunner of Christ. When God speaks, leadership is set to motion. Now, what does this have to do with us? Consider this. That leadership is one of the greatest indicators that God is moving and that God is speaking in an organization. Why, what does this have to do with us? Look around. When people start stepping forward and willing to serve in ministry, when new ministry is started, when leaders become involved in me, when church folk begin to get off their seats and get on their feet and begin to work, it is a sign that God is at work. Because a preacher can't get you out of your seat. An elder can't get you out of your seat. You know, that doesn't happen. That's because God is speaking, and that's what we see. When God is working among us, when God is speaking to our hearts, we're going to see more people committed to ministry. We're going to see more people that are committed to doing the Lord's work. We're going to see more people leading others to Christ. That's what happens when God speaks. Because when God speaks, he begins to tell you what it is he wants of you. Leadership is one of the greatest measures of spiritually healthy church. Because God speaks into the hearts of people and say it's time. 
It's time for you to serve. It's time for you to minister. It's time for you to, to do that. I mean, that's the struggle that any church body has. We have a lot of ideas, and we have a lot of dreams for ministry, but very few people that are willing to take up that task. And when God begins to speak to our hearts, we begin to volunteer and to say, where can I be used? What is God calling me to do? Leadership happens when God speaks. The second thing that happens, according to Joshua 1, in response to God speaking is simply this. Devotion is encouraged. Devotion. And that's exactly what we see. Look at verse 8. Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8. As God speaks, he raises up a new leader. He's not going to leave his people without a leader. He's going to ensure that they go on. Moses died, but the work of God goes forward. I mean, if there's, I mean, this happens all the time. Great men and women God uses for a period of time, and then they are done, and the work does not stop. The work goes on. I can imagine years ago when HMS Richard Sr. died, they thought, oh, the church will never be able to get past this. Or so-and-so dies, or this person dies, or that. Or maybe you're sitting in a church and one pastor leaves that maybe you were really close to and you believed in and you supported and you worked together and God blessed that and good came from that and now he or she is gone. And you're thinking, what now? You know what? God will provide more leadership. God is not going to leave us without. And so that's what he does. Notice then what a good leader does. Joshua chapter 1 verse 8. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe and do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Boy, if if Joshua did anything right, here's what he did. He says, you need to get in God's Word. You need to dust off the book. You need to spend some time with God's Word. He knew that's what would bring about the change that these people needed. It wasn't him that they needed to hear from. It was God. And that's what he does. He says, the book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. In other words, it will always be in your mouth. Why? Because it's going to be in your heart and you're going to meditate upon it from Sabbath to Sabbath. Is that what he says? No. He said day and night. That's why I tell you as as a pastor, I couldn't be more excited what I see happening in our doing life together. We see 40 or 50 or 60, we don't even know how many people because some aren't able to make the small group, but we've got a significant number of our church family that's reading God's Word every day. And you know what's happening? It's changing things. It's changing us. It's changing who we are. And so God says that we should meditate upon it day and night. See, devotion is encouraged. Believe it or not, I saw a study that showed most people forget 95% of what they hear after just 72 hours. 95% of what you hear, you'll forget in 72 hours. That's depressing. That means this great sermon you're hearing, you won't remember anything by Tuesday. That's the truth. Unless I say something about my wife, you're not going to remember I mean, it's because word gets back to her when she's not here and I talk about her. So you guys remember that. But, but that's truth. You'll, you'll forget that. That's why we need to read God's Word every day. Because you forget. I forget. We have a tendency it goes one ear out the other. We just need to keep it going in one ear. As long as we keep it going in, we'll be able to meditate upon it. But friends, if your nourishment comes only from Sabbath morning, from a little sermon, and you're wondering why Wednesday and Thursday and Friday you're falling apart spiritually, it's because it's not there anymore. So he says you must meditate upon it day and night. You see, a lot of people do what's called the skip and dip. They skip through the Bible and dip into a few passages, but not too deep. Hmm. Shallow is another word for it. Shallow. You ever notice we tend to like to read the same passages over and over and over? 
omitting and eliminating 95% of the scripture? Oh, we don't like to go there. That talks about stuff we don't like. Skip and dip. Shallow Bible reading. Shallow Bible study. You know what shallow Bible study makes? Shallow Christians. I mean, think about it. It just stands to reason. So if skipping and dipping is your thing, you're probably not growing. Take some time to meditate upon the Word of God. I love that word, meditate. Meditate. That isn't just reading. That's reading and thinking. That's reading and pondering. That's reading and then asking some of those important questions. What is God saying? I hear what He's saying. I hear what the words are saying. But what is He saying? What is He saying to me? How can I apply this to my life? What is God saying to me in my experience? What sin or weakness is God revealing to me through His Word? That's what it means to meditate. And the Bible says that we should do that day and night. So devotion is encouraged. Here's number three. Strength is offered. Strength is offered. The word of the Lord has power. Can you say amen? Amen. There is nothing more powerful in your life than this word. This word. It's powerful. You hold in your hands something that is so powerful that when it is released into the heart that is open and receptive, everything can change. Don't tell me you got problems or you have situations that are hopeless. Because what you're really saying is, God can't help me. That my situation is so bad that God can't do anything about it. That's not the God I serve. It, you know, God never sees a situation that he is worried about, that he is confounded about, that he is perplexed about. God always can deal with with every situation that you're facing. So strength is offered. Look at what it says in verse 6. Joshua chapter 1 in verse 6, I love this. Be strong. God's people ought to be strong. What should we be? We should be strong and of good courage. For to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Be strong. Look at verse 7. He comes back to it. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. Verse 9 says it again. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid or dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Wasn't that a blessing to read this past week? Oh, I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what lies out there in the future, but you read this in the morning, and you'll go out and you'll be courageous. You'll be filled with faith because God wants you to be strong. Talk about strength. God says not only he'll make you strong, but he will make you invincible. God's word live guarantees success. Do you believe that? God's word lived guarantees success. I believe it. God's word lived allows us to do the impossible. He promises not only that you'll be strong, you'll be invincible. Look at verse 5. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. He says, they can, anybody can stand in front of you, and I want you to know it will not stop you. When you are doing what I have called you to do, when you're walking in my ways, when you're walking in obedience to the leading of my spirit in your life, you are invincible. Well, somebody ought to be happy here. I believe that. I believe that. It's it's time for the people of God to stop just wimping through life. We limp through life. And we see a giant out there, we turn tail and run. And we forget that God is the one who says, I will go with you. I will fight those battles before you. No one will be able to stand in your way when you are walking with me. He offers strength to face the impossible. 
And he offers strength to you to face the impossible that you're facing. Here's the last one. Fourthly, when the Lord speaks, action follows. When God speaks, he gets results. He does. The word of the Lord is never spoken in vain. When God's word is spoken into the heart and we receive it, we're never the same. We don't stay in the same place. We don't stay in the same seat. But God speaks to us and we move. Things change. Things happen. When God spoke to Joshua, it challenged an entire generation. And it fostered a whole new attitude among them. I mean, obviously they were in a better position because the last generation God looked at and said, I can't do anything with them. They just have so little faith and so little trust that they are not going to be able to do what I want them to do. I'll wait for the next generation. God apparently recognized something in this one. And look what happened. The word of the Lord came to Joshua in chapter uh, 1, verse 1. Then he commanded the army officers in a series of instructions. And then look at verse 16. So they answered Joshua and said, All that you have command, excuse me, all you command us, we will do. And wherever you send us, we will go. Boy, if Moses was still in his grave, he'd turn over. I mean, how long he probably waited to hear that from the children of Israel. But God spoke, and as Joshua shared what God was going to do, faith welled up in those people. I mean, it did. These were no longer the same one. They said, all that you have commanded, we will do. Wherever you send us, we will go. He kn- they know where he's going to send them, the very place their fathers refused to go. It's too hard. You remember after the spies came home and told them what they do that night? They cried all night. That's what the Bible says. They went home and cried, and they wept because it was too hard. It wasn't that God said they weren't going to go. They didn't find out about that until later. It was simply they saw that what God was asking them to do was too much for them, and they whined, and they cried themselves to sleep. Now, they know where they're going. They're going to the promised land. They say, all that you command us, we will do, and wherever you send us, we will go. You know what I call that? Followership. Isn't that a good word? Did I just do a George Bush thing? I don't know if that's a real word, but we, you know, that, that's kind of what, what it is. If there's leadership, then there ought to be followership. And that is, all that God commands, we will go. Whatever God asks us to do, we will do. Let me wrap it up this way. Why why do I believe this message is so important? Because I believe we as the people of God are on the banks. We are on the banks. We have been hunkered down for quite a while and we know that God has promised certain things to us. But our faith has been weak. Our faith has faltered. We have become settled and we have become satisfied with just doing church. Friends, i got to believe. i got to believe that God's plan for the church is much different than what we see today. I, I tell you, church isn't so much what we do in church, but what we do as the church out there. You know that, right? I mean, it's pretty easy to be a Christian in here, right? We come, we sing, we talk about Jesus, nobody's going to think, well, they're weird. Go to Walmart and do what you do here. Go to Walmart and say amen every now and then and hallelujah and praise the Lord. Yeah, it's a different story. Now, I'm not saying everybody go to Walmart after church and and witness, but I am saying that let us not be content with what has always been. This is not all that God has called us to. I have a dream. Ever since I became a Christian, I've had a dream of what church should be like. Where there is no politics, where there is no jockeying for position or uh, praise of men, where there is no foolishness, 
about who's going to be in charge or this or that, where there is no arguments about all of the petty things that happen in the church, but that we just be the church, that we, that we live as we've never lived before, and that this become a place that's really nothing more than a pit stop, a refueling station, a place of encouragement, a place where we gather once a week to recharge, rebuild our engines, to tank up, and then to go light the world for Jesus. I, I hope that we will be the generation that will do that. Because here's what I know. If we're not, if we're not willing to be that, God will wait for the next one. Because there's going to be there's going to be a group that finishes this. You know that, right? And if God has to wait us out, he'll wait us out. But here's, here's the secret. This is what enabled them to go over. And it's simply verse 16. All that you command us, we will do. And wherever you send us, we will go. Would you be willing to make that your prayer this morning to God? All that you command me, I will do, and wherever you send me, I will go. I'm not talking about getting on a plane and going on a mission trip. Maybe for some of you that's where it is, but I suggest some of it's going to be living as a missionary in your own home, in your own neighborhood, in your own office, in your own classroom, in your own school, wherever that is. Would you be willing to commit to make verse 16 your prayer? If you would, I want to invite you to stand. And we're going to close with a word of prayer. Don't stand if you don't mean it. Father, as the people of God, we recognize that too often we've idolized the past. We talk about the good old days. We glory in the past. And Lord, all that we gather from what we read in the Bible and what we've experienced with you is while we are to remember the past, we're never to idolize it. That the best days are always ahead for the people of God, or at least for the people of God that are obedient, for the people of God that are willing to go forward in faith, to the people of God who see the vision of what you want. Lord, we're not made to dwell in the desert. We're promised land dwellers. This is not our home. Help us not to be content. Help us not to be satisfied with what has always been, but let us begin to dream what could happen if we will do whatever you ask us to do and if we will go wherever you ask us to go. What a mission statement for a church. Father, I pray as we stand in response to this message that we will hear your voice speak to us. It doesn't matter what we're going through, even in the darkest times, you speak to your people. You have promised that you don't leave us, and you certainly don't forsake us, even though that may not be our experience with you. You've promised not to do that with us. So we're here today, standing, at the close of this message where we've been challenged to be obedient, challenged to go forward, challenged to be the people of faith that you call us to be. Lord, I can't imagine what the future will be like for those that are willing to live out verse 16. But we're standing here, Lord, and in our own ways we're saying that's where we're at. We have heard God speak to us this morning. And now, Lord, we're willing to do whatever you ask us to do. And we're willing to go wherever you ask us to go. Thank you for your word to us this morning. Thank you for the privilege of being the children of God, carrying on the work of God. Father, I pray that you will keep us the men and women of faith you've called us to be. Let us be the Joshuas and the Calebs in our day. In the midst of a faithless generation, may we be full of faith. May we always be reminded that this is not our home. That what awaits us 
over on the other side is, is beyond human comprehension. All we can do is read about the promises and take them by faith. But we're told that when we get there, only then will we realize. And I wonder how many of us will say, why did we mess around so long? Why did we play around? Why were we so satisfied when this is what awaits us? So, Father, keep us focused on the future. Help us to keep in tune with your voice. And we commit to do that and to respond in it. Help us to be strong and courageous. For we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful Sabbath. We'll see you soon.